Welcome to worship at Round Hill Community Church. My name is Shannon White. I'm the pastor for spiritual development here at the church. It's a delight to have you here with us on our online service. A couple of announcements before we begin worship today. This is Transfiguration Sunday, which is why I'm wearing white. And it's the color that's used right before the beginning of Lent, which will happen on Wednesday. Our Ash Wednesday service will be online beginning at noon and it will be later on in the evening for those who visit us in person. Today, February 19th, is the deadline for anybody who's interested in joining a trip that we're going to be taking in October on the, San, on the Camino de Santiago, which is an ancient spiritual pilgrimage in the northwest portion of Spain. And we'll be hiking nine to 12 miles a day. If you are interested, you need to let me know today. Shannon at roundhillcommunitychurch.org. There are lots of other announcements and opportunities for spiritual reflection and worship and service for Lent. You can check on our website and for fellowship. Spring Fling is coming up on March 11th. There is a concurrent children's program over in the meeting room while the adults are over in the community house. So please check that out and sign up as quickly as possible. Our guest preacher today is the Reverend Erin Keyes. She is a friend and long-term colleague of mine, and she is a Presbyterian clergy person and the executive director of the Greenwich Center for Hope and Renewal here in town. So we look forward to welcoming Erin. Let us worship God. Let us pray. We are grateful in the knowledge, O oh great love, that there is love loud enough, bright enough, powerful enough to shine through the darkness. Love is seen in the support of those who reach out a helping hand or a listening ear, who share their stories of hope, who pray for those in need. Allow this love to enter into our hearts. Give us the ability to know it and feel it, and allow it to do a work of healing in us and in the broader community. Amen. And let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So for our children's message today, it actually is one of my favorite passages where God tells all of those around that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God said to Jesus and to all those who could hear it, you are my beloved in whom I am well pleased. And you know what? God says that to each of us. Now, you know, we look to the scriptures sometimes to look at how Jesus lived his life to try to get examples on how we need to live our life, lives. And so I thought about that and I thought, you know what? Jesus was very human and God knew that and loved him so much anyway. So for instance, Jesus, was angry sometimes. And in fact, he threw over some tables in the temple one time when he didn't like what was going on. And you know what? God loved him anyway, even in the midst of the anger. And Jesus was sad sometimes. In fact, when his really close friend died, the shortest verse in the Bible is Jesus wept. God loved him even in the midst of his crying. And Jesus was fearful sometimes too. When he was on the cross, he said, God, why have you forsaken me? In the midst of that, God loved him too, all through that. And then of course, we know that God loved and was joyful, that Jesus was joyful in his life as well. So all of those feelings show us that when we are angry, when we are fearful, when we are sad, when we are joyous and happy, God loves us too and we are God's beloved. In fact, our feelings and our emotions are God-given 
They're really important. And it's important that we use those not to hurt other people, but that we are free to express them as well. So know today, no matter what you're feeling, it's all okay that those emotions are given by God and that you are God's beloved in whom God is well pleased. So let's have a prayer for a moment together. Thank you, God, that we are fully human and all of the feelings that we have and the emotions are given by you and show us how human we are. And in the middle of all of them, even when we don't think we're very lovable, you tell us we are your beloved. Help us to know that today and to live in that truth. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Loving God, we ask that your spirit would fill this place with your peace and wisdom as we listen for your word to us this morning. May you quiet in us every voice but your own, and in the stillness, may we hear what you long for us to know. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The scripture passage for this morning comes from 2 Peter, chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. Let us listen together. Peter writes, For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things, for prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It isn't often, but every once in a while, I come across a passage of scripture that contains within it a term I am extremely familiar with, but not because I knew it was in the Bible. Now, it could be a bit of a risk to admit that there are portions of scripture with which I am not familiar, given that I have been a Christian all of my life and an ordained minister for a big part of it, but there are. I'm just not one of those Christians who has most or even part of the Bible committed to memory, and I'm okay with that. For one, because I have accepted that I'm not good at memorizing things, and two, because it still allows me to be surprised. One of the reasons that I love scripture is because of its timelessness and how because of this, it has been the inspiration for so much art and literature and music. In this way, scripture seeps into history and the present day to the point that sometimes even the most faithful don't fully recognize it when it appears. I think that's amazing. That even when you aren't trying to, you could still be reading the word of God in a poem or seeing it in a painting or hearing it in a song. When I was maybe six or seven years old, I had this little yellow keyboard that I carried around with me everywhere I went. I thought it was so cool. It had these little pictures of the Muppet characters all over it, you know, Miss Piggy, Kermit, Gonzo, Animal, and so on. But also, when I would hit a certain button, the tune from one of the most famous Muppet songs, the Rainbow Connection, would begin to play. And the keys on the keyboard would light up one at a time, teaching me how to play the melody 
myself. Why are there so many songs about rainbows? And what's on the other side? For hours, I would pick out the tune to Rainbow Connection, and while I have no doubt that it drove my parents crazy, I loved it. Now, up until last week, it had been years since I had thought about that little yellow keyboard and the song Rainbow Connection. But reading our text from 2 Peter in preparation for this sermon, it brought the memory right back to me. Because as I read 2 Peter, and particularly verse 19, a term jumped out at me, and I was right back at six or seven years old playing Rainbow Connection on my little yellow keyboard. Verse 19 reads, We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it as a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Now, if you're familiar with Rainbow Connection, maybe you know where I'm going here, but if you're not, verse two of the song says this. Who said that every wish would be heard and answered when wished on the morning star? Somebody thought of that, and someone believed it. And look what it's done so far. So what's the term that both the song and the scripture contain? Morning star. The morning star, which for centuries has been considered the brightest star in the sky. As such, the morning star has become the symbol for light shining in the darkness, and it serves as the perfect focal point for wish-making. Have you ever wished on a star? I have. And again, that is why when I read our text for this morning, I simultaneously was back remembering what it is like to be a child captivated by the notion of wishing on a star, and I was present here some 30 years later knowing that life does not always or even all that often, arrange itself according to our wishes. Considering this, I found myself feeling quite grateful that Second Peter's reference to Morning Star offers us something more tangible, something that he has seen for himself and so he knows it to be true, something that he describes for us when he reminds us of Jesus' baptism and later Jesus' transfiguration, when both times God's voice, the majestic glory, as Peter calls it, proclaimed from the heavens that Jesus was God's son, God's own Beloved, for Peter, that message is the light that remains even in the darkest times. And in this sense, the morning star is not a symbol of a wish cast into the night, but the real Flesh and blood, breathing, laughing, crying, living, dying, and rising again, Son of God. That is it, Peter says. And that's not a wish, but a promise. That because God loved us, he sent his only Son to show us what true love really is. That, 
Peter wants his readers and us to know is the love that you've been waiting for your whole life. And it is the love that will transform your life if you let it. Now, if earlier it was a bit of a risk to share with you that I don't have a lot of scripture memorized, it's going to be even more of a risk to tell you this. As a cradle Presbyterian, baptized, confirmed, and ordained, I have talked a lot about the love of God, but if I'm brutally honest, I haven't really had any idea what I was talking about. I understood the love of God in theory, of course, but I always had this sense that I just wasn't feeling the same thing that others were when they talked about it. And it's not because I didn't want to, I did. But it was because deep down, on some level, I just did not have a lot of experience with a love like that. A love that was above everything else, utterly and completely safe. Now, granted, safe isn't always the first word that comes to mind when we think about the definition of love. Usually, we tend to define love with words like affection, fondness, attraction, desire, intimacy, commitment, fidelity, sacrifice, unconditional and everlasting. But love isn't like that for everyone. For some, love can mean fear. It can mean threat. It can mean someone who says they love you all the while trying to control, dominate, criticize, gaslight, lie, ignore, attack, and abuse you. For some, love means to have no separation between one person and another to the point where one person begins to feel entitled to treat the other in ways that are painful, confusing, disorienting, and even terrifying. That's not love, you may be thinking, and you're right. But sometimes, for some people and in some relationships, love and fear can become indistinguishable. In the last year alone, the Greenwich Police Department responded to 241 cases of domestic violence. And in Greenwich, domestic violence is the second most investigated crime, and it's the number one violent crime. And what most people don't realize is that when there is abuse in a relationship, the primary reason that people don't leave is not because they are weak or naive, but because leaving almost always puts them or their children in more danger than staying. It's a traumatic reality to try to wrap your mind around that a relationship you thought was based in love has become one defined by fear. And it's not just in our human relationships that this happens. It goes on in religion and in our relationships with God all the time. 
How many times have we all heard that God loves us, but if we fail to follow a certain rule, we're going to hell? Or God loves us, but not if we are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or still finding ourselves along the spectrum of sexuality. Or God loves us, but if we want to love ourselves by ending an unhealthy marriage or leaving a toxic church, that love may falter or all out abandon us. So, it's no wonder that some people, and myself included, have not totally known what it means when we're told that God loves us. Depending on the types of relationships we've had in our lives or the type of theology that we have adhered to, it can become difficult to know and more important, feel the truth of the safety that waits for us in knowing that as much as God loves Jesus, so too does God love us. And yet, that is the promise that Peter invites us to believe. A promise that represents more than just a wish on a star on a cloudless night and instead offers us the only thing that any of us really truly need in the first place. To know that we're safe. We are held. We are loved. And that because of this, no matter what comes, we will be okay. Jesus had to know that, or else I don't know how he could have done what he did. Yes, he was brave and bolstered by the power of his calling, but had he not known that even in the midst of the cruelty and suffering and eventual death he would face, that he was ultimately safe in God's love? How else could he have done it? How could he have willingly faced crucifixion if there was not the constant and abiding promise that even in the harshest of pain humans can inflict on each other, he would still be safe in the love of God? Because the thing about safety is that it doesn't necessarily mean protection from whatever might come our way. It would be nice if it did, but that's not real safety. That's avoidance. True safety is not an assurance that life will be easy or painless. Safety does not mean we will not suffer or lament or cry out into the dark night. We will all likely face those times, but true safety, God's safety. God's love reminds us that even in the midst of our pain and sorrow and confusion, we will know that the love that held Christ on the cross and saw him through to the resurrection holds us still. Knowing that we are loved by God, feeling God's love means the assurance that whether it is in this life or the next, when all is said and done, we will be okay. Even better than okay. We will be safe. We will be loved. That is the promise to which Peter invites us to cling. A promise that represents so much more than a wish on a star and offers instead a concrete truth to hold on to. 
So, in that sense, the rainbow connection is probably better left to children's lullabies and the dreams of the innocent. But there is one line in that song that I think even Peter would agree suits our purposes just fine. It's the last verse of the song that goes, have you been half asleep and have you heard voices? I've heard them calling my name. Is this the sweet sound that calls the young sailors? The voice may be one and the same. I've heard it too many times to ignore it. It's something that I'm supposed to be. What is it that we're supposed to be? What we already are. Safe and loved as God's very own. Amen. As we come together for our prayer as a community, we of course think of those and pray for those around Michigan State University campus and the families of those who have been affected, of all the students and the staff and the faculty, and those who have experienced multiple instances of gun violence now. We pray for healing and deep, deep sense of God's presence amidst trauma. And we continue to pray for Turkey and Syria and all those affected in the recent earthquakes. Let us pray. I take this prayer from Gorillas of Grace by Ted Loader. It's called, Sometimes It Just Seems to Be Too Much. Sometimes, Lord, it seems to be too much. Too much violence, too much fear, too much of demands and problems, too much of broken dreams and broken lives, too much of war and slums and dying, too much of greed and squishy fatness and the sounds of people devouring each other and the earth. Too much of stale routines and quarrels, unpaid bills and dead ends. Too much of words lobbed in to explode and leaving shredded hearts and lacerated souls. Too much of turned away backs and yellow silence, red rage and the bitter taste of ashes in my mouth. Sometimes the very air seems scorched by threats and rejection and decay until there's nothing but to inhale pain and exhale confusion. Too much of darkness, Lord, too much of cruelty and selfishness and indifference. Too much, Lord, too much, too bloody, bruising, brainwashing much. Or is it too little, too little of compassion, too little of courage, of daring, of persistence, of sacrifice, too little of music and laughter and celebration. O oh God, make of me some nourishment for the starved times, some food for my brothers and sisters who are hungry for gladness and hope, that being bread for them, I may also be fed and be full. And let us pray together the prayer of Round Hill Community Church, saying together, Our Heavenly Father, shed forth thy blessed spirit upon all our lives. Make each one of us an instrument in thy hands for good. Purify our hearts, strengthen our minds and bodies, fill us with Christian love. Let no pride, no self-conceit, no rivalry, no ill will ever spring up among us. Make us earnest and true, wise and prudent, giving no just cause for offense. And may thy holy peace rest upon us this day and every day throughout the coming week, sweetening our trials, cheering us in our work, and keeping us faithful to the end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
May you go forth from this place knowing that you are safe and you are loved beyond your comprehension by the God of us all. And now may you go forward in peace and with hope. Amen. <laughs>